Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. It is a wound that is unseen, but the pain affects individuals, families, and communities. Intergenerational trauma affects the physical and mental health of countless Alaskans, and healing is important for all of us. You have to accept your gifts and use them. Trauma-informed practices can help overcome the negative impacts of violence, systemic racism, and colonization. We're discussing the path to healing right now on a special live episode of Alaska Insight. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this one hour edition of Alaska Insight. We're coming to you live this evening so that we can engage with the questions of as many Alaskans as we can in this important discussion about the very real and ongoing effects of grief, trauma, and loss that is passed from one generation to the next. Trauma affects our lives in direct and indirect ways. It changes how we see ourselves and others and changes our view on society as a whole. All of us have experienced some level of grief, fear, loss, and we may understand how that affects ourselves. But how does unresolved grief and unhealed trauma affect families and communities? In the book, Healing Collective Trauma, there is a quote by Jewish scholar Arthur Cohen. Cohen said, the generation of children born to Holocaust survivors were the generation that bears the scar without the wound, sustaining memory without direct experience. This was in 1981, 40 years ago. Recognizing that people carry the psychological injuries of their ancestors is not new thinking, but how has the understanding of this inherited pain changed over these decades, and most importantly, what is known about the best methods to reach paths to healing and inner peace. Our panelists tonight have witnessed the effects of generational historical grief in their own families and in their communities, and they are committed to the work of aiding in that collective healing for the strength and health of future generations. We'll meet them in just a few minutes. I want to remind our viewers that we're live over the air and online, and you can submit questions by email to alaskainsight at alaskapublic.org or through Facebook, and I'll gather them together to pose to our panelists during this next hour. Before we start our discussion with our excellent panel, let's watch this profile of a legendary Alaska Native healer. As we've noted in the introduction to tonight's discussion, trauma can be passed down from one generation to the next, but so can healing. Here's a story about how one traditional healer's impact continues to shine even after her death. Alaska Public Media's Jeff Chen reports. The past is gone, blessed it be. I can now close the door and move on to the other ways of being. Traditional healer and Yupik elder, Dr. Rita Pitka Blumenstein, passed away in August. At her 40-day feast, a Russian Orthodox tradition, family and friends gathered to honor her life. Grandmother Rita was um, very special to all of us, the grandmothers. We will miss our little light, as was known by her Yupik name. When you pass, you're here in like a limbo and on that 40 days uh, when you work through everything then you do the repass and you move on to heaven and so that's what we did for Grandma Rita and um, it was so beautiful. Grandma Rita, as she's known, was born on a fishing boat and grew up in Tanunik, a community on Nelson Island in western Alaska. And at an early age, Blumenstein became a healer. When I was 14, I was hired by 
a private doctor and I did the diagnosing. Her grandmas, her great grandma, seven generations um, were healers. And so she had all their healing powers. She was a midwife. She delivered over, oh my gosh, 200 babies. Blumenstein traveled the world with the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers and shared about ancestral knowledge. Back home, she mentored young healers. Amelia Simeonov first met Blumenstein when she was hired to help schedule her events. It grew into more. I ended up being her apprentice. She just started teaching me about Alaska, the traditional Alaska plants, and how to do body energy work. So yeah, this is a talking circle blanket. In May of 2019, Blumenstein told Simeonov she would be a traditional healer and would help people through talking circles and crafts. So from then I went on more healing and forgiving myself and others to prepare myself for that role. Like I quit drinking, I quit smoking, um, I bettered myself for this role so I could uh, be a better role model. That's the thing, it's like a better role model of, for myself and for others. And she's a real good student. She follows everything. And I try to. <laughs> yeah. Blumenstein taught Simeonov and other young healers so this work could continue to happen even after her death. Healers are still here. And even when they pass, we're still able to learn. That was grandma's role. Like, that's what she wanted. Share what you have so the knowledge stays and grows and grows and grows. But you have to accept your gifts and use them the way they come. Yeah. That's the secret of healing. You all have gifts. And you, you have to learn to develop them into the utmost beauty. I love you and... Simeonov says Blumenstein helped so many people feel their own power and that was her true gift to the world. In Anchorage, I'm Jeff Chen. will be the best of friends. Hand in hand, we'll walk along. Thanks, Jeff, for that inspiring profile of a much-respected Alaska Native healer. It's a great way to kick off our discussion tonight. Let's meet our guest experts. Linda Tai is a Fairbanks-based social worker and trauma therapist who works with refugees. Gail Jackson is the founder of Creative Rhythms, a drum circle facilitator and a Rasmussen Foundation fellow. Cook Nay Lance Twitchell is an associate professor of Alaska Native Languages at the University of Alaska Southeast, a language historian, an artist, and a Rasmussen Foundation fellow. And Polly Andrews is the Learning and Development Specialist with South Central Foundation's Family Wellness Warriors Program. Welcome all of you, and thank you so much for being on our panel to help all of us better understand how generational trauma affects people and what can be done to help heal and move toward a brighter future. In the profile story we just heard, Rita Blumenstein said, the past is gone. I can now close the door and move on to the other ways of being. But how do people close the door on the past and move on? Is that even possible? Or is it more closing the door on the reaction to the past and learning to live beyond it? Linda, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, trauma survivors don't have memories. Yeah, they have symptoms. And part of those symptoms is a fundamental shift in how one feels about oneself and how one moves through the world. So yes, there is a lot to be said for shifting the impact of the trauma on, the, on our sense of self and how we move through the world. 
Kuchne, mm -hmm. is the past ever really gone? Uh, I would say it's not. And so in, in our language and in our culture, we carry the names of ancestors before us. And for those who encounter us, we are those people as well. So I met an 80 year old elder. And when he found out my Shinget name, he started calling me uncle. So I would call him nephew. And so because the, we carry these names, we also carry the memory of these names, like my uncle, who when he was very young and was named after one of his uncles, went by the place where he was fishing. And he said, that's the place where I used to fish. And so we carry our histories and our histories inform us. But when we have traumas with our histories, I think we have to analyze the ways that we carry those and the ways that they impact us, uh, which is difficult, I think, for indigenous peoples because we have lost so much in terms of our land and our languages, uh, people, children. It's so much loss that it's, it's difficult sometimes to let go. And sometimes the trauma and the negativity and the violence against self and others is something that just becomes inherited. And so in our language work, we try to figure out how to do what our elders say is to be without it and to let it go. Mm, thank you. Gail, turning to you, is it when you think about the past and whether or not it can ever really be gone, is it understanding how to look at the past without connecting to the pain? I think it's connecting with the past and at times being with the pain because moving through society, we can be triggered again and again, depending on the situation, having a police car pull up behind me and therefore I'm triggered but I can turn to my meditation practices of breathing, being with that pain to settle myself, to ground myself so that therefore I'm not acting out on the triggering because there's a police officer behind me or if someone in the store just cuts in front of me or says something, calls me out of my name, so to speak just having those practices being with what is arising within myself and grounding myself to be aware. Thank you. Polly, how do you think about this, uh, especially reflecting on what our other panelists have said uh, in, in within the wellness warriors program, do you look at um, a way of dealing with the past without clinging to it? Yes, absolutely. I think that um, it's so important to look at our stories and because our stories are connected to the stories of our parents and the stories of our, our grandparents. And so to understand that um, some of the pain and some of the traumas that we may be experiencing in our lives today are may be connected to what the stories of our parents and grandparents and being able to have that understanding um, can lead to healing. I think you said earlier, you said trauma changes how we see ourselves. And when we have the opportunity to share our, under, our stories, we come to grasp an understanding about that pain and about that trauma and about those messages about who we are. And if we can come to that understanding, I think that opens the door to healing. All right, thank you so much. Uh, what a beautiful sentiments from everyone to get us started this evening. And, and I wanna remind our audience that we are coming to you live. If you'd like to join in the conversation, we're doing a one hour special tonight on generational healing, on healing pain of the past, on historical trauma. And you can join the conversation if you'd like to drop comments or questions into Alaska Public Media's Facebook page where we're streaming live. Or you can email comments to alaskainsight at alaskapublic.org. 
I want to uh, let's learn a little more about the work that all of our panelists do and what brought them to it. Gail, describe how you came to understand the healing power and connection that you found through the drum circle facilitation training that you've taken. Hmm. I have learned and connected with people all over the world. Since the pandemic, I have a Monday call with people that I've come in contact with in Korea, Germany, Australia, all over the world. And attending one of my trainings, I heard a strange sound in the room. And I looked around and there were people that were crying and knowing, and that's when I realized and found out the power of the drum. And the drum is a part of every culture. Every culture has a drum. And with that drum, that drum connects us to our heart, that heartbeat that we were in the womb with. And in today's society, when we're in the pace of going here and going there, we forget about that heartbeat that we have within ourselves and that heartbeat that we came into form with in our mother's womb. And when we connect with the drum, connecting with others, our heart space opens and we connect with the power of the drum, which opens us all to connection. When you uh, decided to get this percussion training, were you seeking personal healing or were you thinking more about how it could help others? Well, I knew that it had helped me connecting with people, like I said, all over the world and the feeling that I got within myself, a, a, a sense of fullness, a sense of connection. And from that experience, I wanted to share that experience with others, inviting them in, facilitating community drumming circles in spaces where it's inviting and safe and open for folks to come in to be a part of the community drumming circle, whether it's something that they just take a tap of a bell or on the drum, their voice at times, words have no way of expressing, but through the instruments, people can say a lot. Mm -hmm. Polly, how did you get involved with the Wellness Warriors program? Were you doing other cultural healing or, or maybe your own healing work? What brought you to it? Well, um, you know, part of my own story brought me to the work that I do today, um, looking at the impact of my story and, and my trauma. And I was really interested in um, the work and the philosophy of of family wellness warriors and wanting to be a part of an organization where it's our native people leading in in our own health care. It's our native people leading in, in our own healing. And um, yeah, so I'm with South Central Foundation Family Wellness Warriors and it's that story and that picture of indigenous people healing themselves and passing that healing on to the next generation and so it's people leading in our own health. It's our own people creating and leading programs that address the whole person health. And at the heart of everything that we do is, is relationship, the building of healthy relationship. And at the heart of everything that we do is story, because everything that concerns our health and our wellness and our healing goes back to relationship. It goes back to our stories and being able to heal in that. And so one of those programs um, within the NUCA system of care is Family Wellness Warriors. And um, I get to be a part of, of that healing with, with my people and, and for my people. The Wellness Warrior seeks to help people return to their own true selves. Describe how that works and and how it was developed. Yes, so um, our name, the name of Family Wellness Warriors is Nuiju, 
which is a Denina Athabascan word that was gifted to us, and it means returning to our true selves. And it it carries that idea that our true self is who the creator intended us to be. And that's that's within our strengths. That's our good teachings. That's our good ways and all those good things that came from our grandparents, that came from our ancestors before us. And it carries that idea that healing lies within returning to our strengths and returning to those good ways. And when we return, we come back to our true selves and that is healing. Absolutely, thank you. Hukne, when you were in school, you said you didn't feel very often that it was for you. Was it most often in the way history was taught or was it all the curriculum and how teachers conducted classroom instru instruction? Talk a little bit about why you felt like you didn't have a place there. Yeah, uh, I was born in Skagway, Alaska and um, my father is Yupik and Sami and my mother is Kigani Haida and Klukahadi Klingit. And then I, we moved to Anchorage when I was pretty young. And I think when I went to school was when I had started to experience quite a bit of racism that was both at an individual level, so one person treating me different because of who I was, and then at an institutional level. Um, I had an Alaska Native teacher when I was in the fourth grade, which I think was, was fabulous. But then I started noticing, well, where's, where are the other Alaska Native peoples? And then as we went through school, I just realized like, it just didn't seem to fit with, with me and what, what I was, who I was, I didn't see my people. And so I think still today, this is, this is a systemic problem with education. My theory is most people who graduate high school in Alaska couldn't tell you the 23 Alaska Native languages. They couldn't name 20 prominent Alaska Native peoples from history. They couldn't tell you what ANGSA is or what a tribe is. And, and I think there's a reason why these things are made invisible. Uh, it's a contribution to indigenous erasure. And I think it goes throughout all, all modes of education. And I noticed this when I went to college as well. In 1996, I started to learn the Thlingit language with my grandfather. We were very close. And I re realized through his sister that he spoke the Thlingit language, and I, I asked him to teach me. And initially he would say things, like he'd point at the salt and he'd say, eight, and I'd try to say it and he'd laugh at me. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna get, get him to stop laughing at me. And so it became this connection. And then I encountered this text called Stabilizing Indigenous Languages, which just happened to be dropped off at the University of Minnesota where I was going to school. And I was inspired by that book and I wrote a paper called Stabilizing Indigenous Languages. And the teacher assistant wrote on there, uh, C minus, why doesn't everybody just speak English? And there was no feedback on my, on my work and my research and my writing. And I was angry. And so I protested and I brought it to the dean. I brought it to the head of the English department and I got the grade overturned. But it just showed me that this systematic exclusion of indigenous peoples and histories, uh, it wasn't just an Alaska thing. And so as, as I started to talk with other Native American folks who were down there and we, we rallied together and we, we learned how to sort of stand up for things and how to uh, usurp a system that's built to exclude us, I started to think about my role in education and uh, started working for tribes back, back home in Skagway and then down in Kassan and then went back to school in Fairbanks and as I was studying in Fairbanks, just kept thinking about how I could continue learning and teaching the thing at language. And at the same time, realizing what kind of situation our language is in, which Dr. Michael Krauss said probably eight years ago, we stand to lose more Native American languages in the next 30 years than throughout the entirety of contact with European nations. And I don't think enough people know that. And I don't think enough people realize that that's not a predetermined thing. That's something that we collectively decide every single day, if that's the route we're going to go is with a Native American genocide. And typically the answer is, 
well, we'll just go along because we don't have to think about it. But I think the conscious thinking about it and shifting that direction and reforming education to create room is the direction to go. Very well said. Linda, you started working in this type of therapy after reading a book and realizing you yourself were a survivor of inherited trauma. Tell us about this realization and the personal work that followed for you. Sure. So in 2014, I read The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And it was a book about his own experiences as a researcher and as a psychiatrist working with trauma. And it started with Vietnam veterans and then moved into childhood trauma, sexual abuse survivors. And as Bessel tells the story of his career, I started to see myself in all of the clients that he was describing. And yet I had no memories of any sort of traumatization that had happened to me. And yet I had all the symptoms of a trauma survivor. My nervous system would very easily, you know, I'd become anxious. My heart rate would go up and it would take a long time for me to have my heart rate go back down. And so I would resort to certain behaviors or substances as ways of coping. And I thought that that was normal. And I had struggles with moving through the world with relationships with myself and with other people. And yet I didn't know that, that, that there was any other way of being. And so in reading The Body Keeps the Score, that spurred me to come to a, uh, a compassionate acceptance that there was trauma in my own history that I couldn't remember. And yet it spurred me, it spurred me to get curious. And in my curiosity, I then started to learn more and more about trauma. And that also led me to learn about adult children of Holocaust survivors and adult children of alcoholics. And my parents aren't Holocaust survivors and they aren't alcoholics. And we survived the Vietnam War and we survived communism at the end of the Vietnam War. And we fled Vietnam by boat and we sought refuge. You know, we were refugees and lived in a refugee camp and the amount of trauma that happened to my people during that experience. And it's only in recent years that I've come to terms with the sheer amount of loss that actually goes with trauma, where it's the loss of culture and the loss of language. And my parents raised myself and my little sister in another country bereft of their ancestors to be able to help them. And part of that dislocation from home is also a dislocation from a, a sense of home within our bodies. And so for me as a child, I never felt that my parents were physically there because they were homesick. They had so much of their own trauma to deal with. There was a lot of survivor guilt, the inability to enjoy their lives because they had somehow managed to escape and survive. And so many were left behind. And so I actually, I, I phrase it vicarious survivor guilt in that when being raised by parents who didn't know how to enjoy their lives, I then inherited the inability to enjoy my life. And I see that among so many of my clients, as well as my peers, that work becomes a secondary satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You, you said that trauma in an individual can be mistaken for personality. Talk about what this means. Yeah, so trauma is constriction. Yeah, so in an individual, trauma can look like control. It can look like being uptight. It can look like being defended, being guarded, being defensive, being protective. And it can also look like the opposite of constriction. It can look like being very, very, very easygoing where I'll say yes to anything or anyone in order to appease in order to make someone else happy or happier or less dangerous so that I can avoid further harm or any potential harm to myself. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Gail, I wanna back up to you again. Um, in an earlier interview, you, you said that the word healing uh, 
that it creates an expectation that something will change and it may not. Talk about that. Do you work to help people understand that they may not, likely will not, feel all better tomorrow? Yes, I, I think the word healer, is, it sets a person up to think that whatever is present is going to be gone. And so therefore, I, I don't use that word at all. Because with the work that I do, I feel it's transformational. That wherever this person is in this moment, doing the practices of drumming, of mindfulness practices, or even with the sound, that the, the practice is, is transformative. So that whatever that is, if they're feeling anxious, that over time with those practices that they become less anxious, that it doesn't go away, but the triggering of whatever made them anxious lessens over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Polly, you said previously that part of the solution for healing is the need to embrace both sides, those who were harmed and those who caused the harm. That sounds like it would be very, very difficult for many people to sort of wrap their head around. How do you do this in a way that doesn't create more harm? Um, yeah, thank you for asking. Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge something that Linda had said earlier. Linda talked about how often when there's trauma in our lives that we oftentimes we aren't aware that we are carrying that trauma and how part of surviving is often lived through those unhealthy behaviors and coping, whether that is addiction, um, unhealthy anger, um, unhealthy relationships, uh, control, and, and those sort of things can be present in our lives from the trauma that entered our lives. And we end up passing some of those same harms down to the next generation and without even realizing that it's happening. And so, um, at the Family Wellness Warriors, we really go to that place of acknowledging that place and acknowledging that to end cycle of har harm, we, we've got to embrace both sides, those who have been harmed and those who have caused harm, because we realize that that trauma is passed down and it, it happens in generational cycles. And most of us who have experienced trauma as children, we end up repeating those same traumas and it gets passed down. So here today, we're involving both sides and we're showing that intergenerational healing is possible and that people who harm can be become a part of that, that healing. Because I, I myself, as someone who has experienced childhood trauma, I grew into adulthood and in some ways, I passed those unhealthy behaviors to my own children without even realizing or understanding what was happening. And um, and so for me, I've got to embrace both sides, the, the side that has harmed and, and the side who has been harmed. Um, and, and it's really embracing the full picture in order to heal that full circle of intergenerational trauma. Because it's really difficult to heal if you don't forgive. Is it even possible to heal without forgiveness? Well, I think that um, such a huge part of the healing process is acknowledging and acknowledging, you know, comes through the sharing of our stories and understanding the impact of our stories and the impact that we have and or with those around us um, through our relationships, the, the impact that we have within relationship, how we had been harmed in relationship, but we also heal in healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chukne, you said equity is the absence of disparity. Please describe what that means and how that can be achieved. Yeah, so a lot of the work that uh, some of us do here in Juneau uh, with groups like Hatuch uh, Sachish, Aware, 
Click in Haida at the University of Alaska Southeast Juno School District is a lot of anti-racism training. And uh, it's it's a bit tricky these days because I think there's anti-anti-racism work that, that also goes on. Uh, and, and people sort of see anti-racism work as anti-whiteness work. And, and I think there's some things we need to really sort of examine with that. But when we talk about equity, uh, we're not saying like everybody needs to get the same stuff. What we're saying is equity is the absence of disparity. So if you look at things and you see that the numbers don't line up, then, then you have to sort of examine what could be going on. So if Alaska Natives are more than 20% of the population, that means nearly one out of every four Alaskans is Alaska Native, then you should sort of be seeing similar numbers uh, for example, and faculty in the University of Alaska, which is about probably three to 4% Alaska Native. Uh, and then you should also be seeing, if you look at graduation rates, incarceration rates, other, other, whatever sort of statistic you're looking at to measure either the success or the difficulties that populations face, they should be about the same. And if they're not, and if they're pretty steadily different across the board, then I think you have inequity. And then you have to do analysis of systems and you have to do analysis of behaviors and practices and expectations. And you have to talk about stereotypes and you have to talk about a whole bunch of stuff to sort of figure out, well, how could you shift at a foundational level, at a structural level? Because the things that people learn in school, if we look at what kinds of things are mandatory, if we look at what kinds of things are optional, and then we feel look at what types of things are phased out as we go further along, because those things are seen as the serious subjects or the required and needed subjects in order to have success in the world. Then we have to sort of say, well, are those standards inclusive? Uh, could you do one year of Alaska Native Languages to graduate high school? I think that'd be amazing. Could you put the place names that were here for, for thousands of years back onto the land as official names. I think that would be fantastic. Can you recognize that people's homes were burned down and villages were built on top of them? And then when news stories came out about those things, it made fun of the fact that it happened. Like, could you imagine if a, a fire burned down like in a, basically an entire community? And when the newspaper wrote about it, they're making jokes about roasting hot dogs and marshmallows on the burning homes. And that's what happened to our people. That's what happened to our villages. And that's what the media did with, with the information. And it's a joke, it's funny, the displacement of indigenous peoples and then the ongoing suffering that we see. So the suffering that we saw before, I think continues to echo because we collectively fail to examine it and to see how could anti-indigenous racism of the past translate to the anti-indigenous racism that we see right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We're going to watch another profile, um, but before we do, uh, I, I just want to remind our viewers that we are live tonight, and um, you should feel free to weigh in with your comments or your questions. Uh, what questions do you have for our guests? You can send them to Alaska uh, Alaska Insight at alaskapublic.org, or you can also drop them into Facebook. And now we're going to watch another profile of a group of young Pacific Islanders who are supporting each other and using online life in a more positive way. The pandemic has made many of us feel isolated within our own communities, often leading to severe impacts to our mental health. A group called Nijin Lounge formed recently in Alaska to connect young Pacific Islanders with one another for the revolutionary act of sharing feelings. Here's a look at how they formed so they could address difficult topics in their community. Tala Falava, my name is Dash. I am a board member of the Pacific Community of Alaska and I'm here to represent Nijin Lounge. Like I literally just opened Facebook. This first post, this person is in the military, suicide death. Every other news feed is a rest in peace post. My prayer warriors, please pray for my so-and-so. You know, those are literally all the posts that I see on Facebook when I scroll. And a lot of it was COVID related. And I'm just like, what can we do as a 
as a community like to come together okay there it goes so what we're going to start off by doing so welcome everybody to Tunisian lounge we started off as just three people three young people having conversations of how there's not much of a space when it comes to our pacific islander um, communities and individuals like to share like you know and just vent out like you know their feelings and things like that it was very taboo when it comes to very vulnerable conversations so we just decided let's let's do it hello talofan welcome I am we started the conversation you. around covid and then everybody wanted to talk about identity everybody wanted to talk about mental health like you know depression and all these you know these different things and culture so yeah and then we just went along with it Nijian Lounge is a space for Pacific Islanders to just let go, let go of things. That's really heavy on your heart, heavy on your, your mind. So our, our Zoom calls are very, very intimate. A lot of tears in a lot of those conversations, but it's, like, I guess that's the, like, you know, the epiphany for me. Like, trauma comes in so many different forms, so we're, if, in, like if um, if our young people or if our individuals are not addressing it to to a way that's a, like healing, you know, it's gonna it's just gonna go down like generation like generational trauma. I'm so happy to be here. This is my first Nijian Lounge. That's why we have these spaces so where they can share and we can support them however we can. As much as like we love to come together and like be in the space like physically. Like this virtual world has, like with COVID, has brought us together in a way that we never thought was possible, you know, and that's, that's very powerful. This is such a great example of people using the internet in a way that helps build connections rather than making us feel more isolated. But how do you recommend managing that so that people, especially younger people, use it in a healthier way to avoid screen addiction, and the despair that can come from the perception that everyone else is having a grand time when you might not be. Hukne, you're an educator. When is the internet helpful and when is it not, especially in education? Yeah, well, we've been trying for years now to try and figure out how do we utilize the internet to connect folks to language learning. So some of the languages that we work in have 30 speakers left, 10 speakers left, you know, sometimes 50 speakers left. And so the reality is there's several communities that have no speakers. And then we have people who are living all over. We had someone calling in from Guam to a language class one time. And so as we have folks who are learning with us, uh, we're trying to figure out how to keep it really uh, dynamic and interactive if, if we have folks who are online and folks who are in the room. And when the pandemic really sort of pushed us into lockdown, which was the responsible move to make, but a, a difficult decision because then we can't be around our elders who are our, our top notch speakers of our languages. Uh, we had to reach out to families and, and make sure that they could connect. We had to get I, iPads or, or other sort of devices to our elders so that they could connect. But we started partnering with with other groups like Outer Coast and Central Council of Clinket and Haida and Sea Alaska Heritage Institute to say, what if we just made our classes free and available? And we just sent folks the links. And so we're sitting there last summer with 150 people learning a language that might have 30 or 40 speakers remaining. And so it was a healing thing for folks to, to have that and to say, well, maybe this helps me to pause my life for a moment and to realize I do have time for this. Because when it comes to indigenous languages, I think there's lots of things that have been put in place to help us, to, to get us to think that we don't have the time and we don't have the energy. And I would, but if only this thing or that thing or the other thing. So it helps us to set some of those other distractions aside and say, well, if I actually just sort of went for it, and then I became part of this language learning and use community, then it can help me to transform my identity in, in, in positive ways, and it can help to fill a gap. Uh, one of our elders who, who went to a boarding school, who, who had a hard time, who was violently attacked and abused by a teacher for using her language, she, she told us, 
nothing can measure up to our language. And so I, I do think that there are ways that we can connect and we're trying to also figure out it can't always just be the same thing, sitting there and studying and sitting there and studying. So right. how can we get people out of their chairs at time? And how can we just build this sense of community of folks who are doing this mm -hmm. like-minded? Absolutely. Linda, how do you help people through psychotherapy when the system that created it is rooted in colonial practices? Mm -hmm. You know, taking a decolonized and anti-oppressive approach to psychotherapy is something that I really fell into because of my own experiences of wanting to get help um, and yet not feeling comfortable getting help within systems that are so rooted in Eurocentric approaches. And so, you know, being able to acknowledge to a client that there are forces and systems and institutions in society that are contributing to their experiences of mental wellness. To be able to help someone name the forces of the patriarchy, the forces of colonization, the forces of toxic capitalism, the forces of racism that are structural. And so that this way they can recognize that trauma isn't PTSD, it's not post-traumatic stress disorder, it's present and pervasive and current and institutionalized and systemic. Mm. And that can help to alleviate that person from that fundamental sense of there's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you, yeah? It's the systems within which we operate. And the Eurocentric approaches to, to psychotherapy lean towards this notion that if you do the work in the four walls of my office, then you can go back out there into the world and be happy and free or happier, yeah? However, what if it's actually the conditions of the world that is contributing towards your low self-esteem? What, what if it is actually the messages that are implicit within our media, within the systems in which we live that are causing for us to actually experience anxiety that is real? Mm. And maybe perhaps as a mental health professional, I can help to normalize and name some of those experiences so that we can work on the things that we can so that you can have more effectiveness as you move through the world, knowing that not all of it is you. Right. Thank you. Mm. We're going to watch another short video now. Uh, the hour is going by so fast and there, I, I wish we had two hours this evening with our excellent panel. Another area of trauma can be the family and societal pressure against L LGBTQ plus people. A new film project called Dear Kin by Inupiaq and Mexican filmmaker Alexis Salee seeks to humanize and normalize the stories of LGBTQ plus people to highlight the message that whoever we are, we're all okay. As someone that's queer and Alaska native, I, it really came from not really having that representation um, of someone that's indigenous, but also queer, and then feeling kind of stuck in these two worlds and not, not ever feeling like you fit in somewhere. Hearing these messages from all different tribal nations throughout Alaska and where they draw their strengths from, what they've experienced, um, and, and almost like, you know, I think as, as a viewer is it feeling validating and very healing on, on the other side, um, to have someone that connects with you in that way is been really a beautiful experience. Dear Ken, Hello, how are you? My name is Baninik. English name, Kai Ash. I identify as non-binary or trans. I am from the small village located on the Lower Yukon, Cough Lake, Alaska. From the age of 10, I have always known that I was different than the other kids growing up. There was a certain flair coming from within, one I wasn't too certain about. Since then, there was always this growing fear that both family and friends would find out I like boys. At the age of 12, that fear became reality 
when I was experimenting with another boy behind a public building. A group of kids came around and caught us with their pants down. Literally. All I could do at the time was run away from them as best I could. Fast forward six, seven years, I finally decided to come out as gay through social media. As time went on, I began to slowly but surely settle into this world I set out for myself when I was 10. I have become more and more comfortable with who I am as a person, which sparked an interest in the art of drag as I grew older. If it wasn't for drag, I wouldn't have further explored who I am as a person. In the art of drag, there is a whole new persona that needs to be created for the stage. Well, from what I've been told, that is. It allowed me to be the person I've always wanted to be growing up. Feminine, strong, emotional, and someone to look up to. Performing as a drag queen made me love and appreciate myself on a whole new level. And if I were to say a few words to the queer indigenous peoples from the past, present, and future, it would be this. Love and appreciate yourself, even on the most tough days. There are people out there who will value you as a whole and who will love you unconditionally. The path ahead of you may be dark and dreary, and there may be some times when you're walking alone. But keep in mind to always be strong and move forward. Be proud to be Two-Spirit, LGBTQ+, and Alaska Native. The video series will be on display at the Anchorage Museum starting on October 4th. The part of the closing line, be proud to be Two-Spirit, really stands out to me. Part of healing is embracing who you are, and that's universal to all people. Can you reflect on that, the power that comes from recognition and acceptance? Polly, I want to go to you, and um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so give me your answer, and then we'll, we'll go to Gail and close out. Yes, um, I just want to reiterate, you know, that power of of our story uh, and being connected to the story of our parents and our grandparents. And, um, you know, I, I was 27 years old when I first had that opportunity to share my story in a, in a safe place and to understand that story. Um, and several years later, my adoptive mom went through this training Adiga house and shared her story. And a year or two later after that, my 87 year old grandmother shared her story mm. and, and experienced the healing within Adiga house, the training intensive. And I don't know what stories they chose to share. I just know that there was healing there and in that that's three generations of of healing very um, powerful from stories that were very difficult and i i'd like to say that my in breaking those cycles and understanding those stories and being a healthier mom my children are being parented by a mother who who has broken cycles and is a more whole return to herself version of of her than she's been before so your story matters and, and your voice matters. That's a joyful message. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Gail, I want to turn to you in our last minute here. Reflect on the power that comes from that recognition and acceptance of who you are. It's letting go of the layers, doing the work to let go of what society puts us, puts on us. The generational trauma that we experience doing the work because the answer is within us and when we peel off those layers our light shines we become what speaks to our hearts what brings smiles what lights us up what gives us that joy every morning or day and knowing that okay this too will pass and then we can move on and start anew again Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we did have a couple of questions that came in through uh, Facebook, and unfortunately, we're not going to have enough time to get to those this evening.
but we'll be forwarding those on to our guests and hopefully they can uh, provide some answers for some of those questions. So thank you so much, all of you, Linda, Polly, Chukne, and Gail for being with us this evening. It's been a very powerful experience and, and I hope it brought some comfort to our viewers. So thank you very much and thank you so much for the work you do on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much for this evening, for a discussion that hopefully brought a glimpse of understanding and clarity to someone in despair. Pain feels so personal, but there are others who may know the same type of struggle that you're having and can offer a hand of assistance to guide you to a better place of less struggle and inner turmoil. Because surviving keeps us alive, but thriving is the path to fulfillment and true happiness. That doesn't mean there won't be pain or setbacks at times. We're humans, and some days may be fine, some not. Even when we're emotionally healthy, we will still have good and bad days. But together, we can move into an equitable future where those good days become the normal for all people rather than the exception for too many. Thank you for joining us this evening. Take good care of yourself and connect with others to share in the journey toward inner peace and strength. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. Be sure to tune in daily to your local public radio station for Alaska Morning News and Alaska News Nightly every weeknight. Be part of important conversations happening on Talk of Alaska every Tuesday morning. And visit our website, alaskapublic.org, for breaking news and reports from across the state. While you're there, sign up for our free daily digest so you won't miss any of Alaska's top stories of the day. We'll be back next Friday. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.